Occasionally, I'll randomly come across a movie that for some reason had completely slipped past my radar, while somehow still managing to tick all of the right boxes for me. I would usually just put this down to an unlucky happenstance, but well, it seems to have happened more times than I'd care to admit, leading me to think that there might be something more going on than I originally thought. That being my stupidity, it had just happened to me recently with the movie The Ritual, an excellent British horror movie from 2017 that I knew I had to see just a mere 30 to 40 seconds into the trailer before I shut that off and began to watch it for myself. But before we jump into that, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is a service designed to help keep you safe online, while at the same time unlocking the web to give you access to region locked content. Developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers in 2020, Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure for everyone. The service encrypts your data and hides your virtual location. If you ever connect to public Wi Fi, say in a coffee shop or on a train, for example, you're essentially broadcasting your data to everybody around you for people to then go and do whatever they want with it. But Atlas VPN ensures that your data and internet traffic is safe. Not only is it a great way to keep your information private from individuals or companies, but the service also comes with a myriad of different benefits. Its new third-party tracker blocker protects you from pesky trackers around the web that would otherwise keep track of your online activities and then sell that data off to companies or advertisers. As well as its new data breach monitor, a security feature designed to track any of your data breaches across the web by scanning leaked databases across the web and then informing you if any of your information has been leaked so you can adequately protect yourself. And something that is incredibly important to me is getting access to shows or movies that otherwise might be region locked in my area. For example, want to watch something that's exclusive to US Netflix but you're not in the States. Well hop on Atlas VPN, change your region and the world will open up to you, giving you access across all of your devices. So if you're interested in what Atlas VPN has to offer then click the link in the description because currently Atlas VPN is running a huge discount for their free year deal for just $1.39 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. Click that link to find out more. The movie begins by facing us with everyone's biggest horror, getting old. We're introduced to a group of friends in a pub who have all known each other since university, but have since gone to grow up, become family men, and start successful businesses. Dom, Phil, Robert, Luke, and Hutch. They're discussing the idea of having one final lads holiday together, since having kids and running a business kinda gets in the way of that sort of thing. But they're self-aware enough to realise that going to Ibiza or Amsterdam to party like they might have once in their youth isn't exactly them anymore. So in typical aging men fashion, Robert proposes the idea of a hike known as the King's Trail, a route that will take them right between Norway and Sweden and would be the perfect excuse to go and experience something other than a typical British drinking holiday. On the group's walk home from the pub, Luke and Robert decide to enter a store to buy a bottle of vodka, but what they don't realise is that they've walked right into the middle of a robbery. Luke hides behind an aisle and clutches his bottle of vodka, battling with himself and trying to pluck up the courage to intervene, as the thieves have now diverted their attention to Robert. He hands over his wallet, but refuses to give them his wedding ring, so they respond to this by brutally caving his skull in with a metal pole and Luke just sits there and watches on in horror as one of his best friends is murdered right in front of him. It then cuts to Luke six months later in northern Sweden exiting a tent, with that either being a flashback or a dream of previous events. The other friends from that night are also there and they exit their tents, all but one. Robert didn't survive the savage attack. They've decided to go on this trip in his honour. It's something that Robert wanted to do, but due to him having half of his skull detached from the other half, well he can't. They've made the trek out here and climbed a mountain to perform a little memorial for him. And after staying up there for the night, the next day they decide to head back to the lodge that they've been staying at. But shortly after taking off, Dom slips and badly damages his knee. With the idea of the walk now being twice as long due to Dom's injury not exactly being appealing to the men, they instead decide that a quicker route would be to go directly through the forest in front of them instead of all the way around it like they had originally planned. With all of these men clearly not realising that they're main characters in a horror movie, they enter the incredibly thick, dense and hard to navigate forest. It begins fairly well and they begin to throw around the type of friendly banter that you'd expect from a bunch of British men who have known each other for years. 
you know, relentlessly mocking each other, the standard British way. Now quite deep into the forest, that is so dense that it's hard to see 20 feet ahead of you, they stumble into the gruesome scene of a hung up stag. Lifted from the ground, impaled into the trees, and completely disemboweled. They speculate that it could be the work of hunters, or perhaps even a bear, but with them ultimately being unsure as to why it's there, or who put it there, they smartly decide to hurry away from it, but not so smartly decide to keep venturing deeper into these woods, as they notice it's bleeding so whatever or whoever did this is more than likely still around. This kill is set up in a way that it's quite close to the entrance of the forest, almost as if it's a deliberate choice to put it there, like whatever put it there wanted it to be seen by potential travellers. Like heads on spikes, almost as a warning that screams, stay far away from these woods. Night quickly falls, followed by the heavy Nordic rain, and the group begin to discover several markings carved into trees, before discovering a cabin that looks long since abandoned. They break into the cabin for shelter, and just like the history books, in classic British visiting a foreign land fashion, Dom begins smashing the place up. Sure, he's doing it for firewood, but they've entered a forest that they very clearly shouldn't be in, broken into somebody's home, and have now begun destroying their property. It's almost as if they're looking for trouble. Luke thinks that he can hear something out in the woods. He's clearly put on edge by this, with the very clear feeling that something isn't right here. Although at the same time, it is a forest in the middle of a heavy storm, I'm sure most of the noises are unusual. Inside the cabin, they discover yet more runes like the ones carved into the tree, but that appears to be the very least of their problems, because after looking around upstairs, they make the freakish discovery of some kind of effigy, a headless, humanoid creature with antlers for hands. Not exactly the type of thing that you want to be coming across in a pitch black cabin in the middle of the woods. This place clearly isn't a hunter's lodge like they might have previously thought. Something inhabits these woods, and it preys to creepy humanoid headless effigies, which realistically should be your cue to turn around and leave those woods. That night, as the men are sleeping, we as the viewer can hear footsteps of something large approaching the cabin before we can then hear the breathing sounds of something reminiscent of a horse, followed by the deep guttural sound which most definitely isn't from a horse, unless that horse is the vocalist of a death metal band. Luke is woken up to a bright light shining into the cabin. He opens the front door, and instead of being greeted by the sight of the forest, he instead finds himself back in the store where Robert was murdered six months earlier. He's suddenly brought back to reality, and finds himself standing outside of the cabin in the daylight, as he notices something disturbing the trees in the distance, before he then looks down to discover several puncture marks in his chest. Confused by this, he re-enters the cabin to discover that his friends are scattered all over it, each of them suffering from from their own kind of extreme nightmare. After snapping Dom and Hutch out of it, Luke realises that Phil isn't here. He looks around and then heads upstairs to the room with the effigy and discovers Phil sitting there completely naked in a dreamlike state, praying towards the statue. With their moods drastically different from the day before, no more optimism and no more dry British humour, they exit the cabin to discover that all of the surrounding trees are now covered in the rune markings. Even though Hutch knows the exact direction the group should head in, Dom insists on walking down a newly discovered path, with him explaining that it's clearly man-made, so there must be civilization nearby. With the group having no other choice than to follow him, they eventually discover yet another cabin. But taking the lesson they've just previously learned about entering creepy cabins in the woods, they make the smart call to stay far away from it to avoid any interactions with creepy headless figures. The group stop for a moment due to Dom's injury, and while waiting around in this incredibly thick forest, Luke decides to go ahead and check over a nearby ridge to see if he can see anything. And much to the surprise of no one, what he discovers discovers is yet more forest. But what he doesn't expect to see is some kind of strange hand, followed by the outline of an enormous creature quickly moving away into the dense tree line. Understandably quite terrified that he had just encountered a literal forest monster, he runs back to the guys and tries to explain what he's just seen. Dom, already injured and annoyed, being no stranger to saying how he really feels, begins to blame Luke for them being there, telling him that it's his fault Robert died and he's a coward for not stepping in. 
ignoring the fact that they could very well be mourning two dead friends instead of one, to which Luke calmly responds by walking over to him and punching him in the face. This little argument conveniently diverting the attention away from the fact that Luke has just seen a literal forest-dwelling monster the size of a double-decker bus. Night falls once again, proving there to be nothing particularly short about this so-called shortcut, leaving the group with no choice but to once again pitch their tents and hold down for the night. As Luke's attempting to sleep, he hears the same creature outside of the tents that we heard outside of the cabin. After going to investigate the strange noise, he once again enters the dream where he witnesses Robert's murder right before his eyes. A large creature passes over his tent and violently rips another tent from the ground. Before he then wakes up to the sound of Phil screaming out for help after something has torn open Hutch's tent and taken him away into the night. The trio can hear a loud guttural sound in the distance, followed by the sound of Hutch's blood-curdling screams. But after they can't find him in the dark, they're forced to wait it out until sunlight before once again going to search for their friend. And eventually, after pushing through the woods, they discover him. Their fears are realised, as the sound of Hutch's screams were in direct response to something pulling him from the ground, gutting his insides and impaling him to a tree, exactly like the stag that they encountered earlier on. It was a warning of what would happen to them if they pressed further on. And well, they pressed further on. Hutch had assumed a sort of unofficial leader of the group role. Hutch was respected by the men and took charge most of the times while keeping spirits up and being quite jovial about things. But now that he's dead, the men can no longer blissfully explain away the strange occurrences happening in these woods. Something is out here with them and now they all believe it. With no way of burying or carrying him out of the woods, they decide to push onwards, knowing whoever or whatever did this would likely be back. They come across a Stream, and after stopping to drink from it, they notice footprints in the mud. Breaking the horror movie trope of walking directly into danger, they decide that it's probably best if they don't follow those footsteps, because chances are they aren't going to want to meet the people that they belong to. And as they're continuing on their journey, what they don't realise is that something is watching them and has been following them this entire time. As the viewer, after realising that this creature has the ability to just sit there unnoticed in plain sight, it starts to make you paranoid. You never get that moment of relief, that mental break from the tension. It could be in any upcoming shot, or perhaps it's been in many of the previous shots and we've just not noticed it. And I'm not sure what's more terrifying. Not only has it been fooling the group, but it's also been fooling the viewer. Eventually, Luke spots a break in the tree line and can see the end of the forest in the distance, but that's immediately followed by him noticing several strange fires in the distance, far too spread out and precise to be natural, and considering that it's been raining a lot recently, chances are that it isn't just the creature out here with them, but there's also people too. After walking back to tell his friends, in the span of a split second, he sees Phil get violently grabbed and pulled off into the trees. He finds Dom, and they both make a run towards the exit, but whatever took Phil is coming for them too. And as they're running from it, they see Phil's lifeless corpse strung up in the trees, just like how they found Hutch earlier. They make it to the previously spotted fires, which leads them into a wooden cabin. And with us already knowing that these guys and creepy forest cabins don't mix, upon entering, they're both immediately knocked unconscious. They both wake up to find themselves restrained, and they can hear the muffled, deranged sounds of people reciting something, almost as if they're praying. Luke manages to get a peek outside, and he can see that there's people and that they're constructing something, before an old lady enters the room, notices the marks on Luke's chest, before revealing that she too has the same cuts. After realising that Dom has no markings, she has him taken away, where another woman explains to Luke that he's been taken so that he can prepare for the sacrifice. Some time passes, and Dom is eventually taken outside and tied to the post that they were creating earlier, where he then gets the view of multiple decomposing corpses strung up in the trees in the exact same fashion as Hutch and Phil. Day turns to night and eventually something large and loud begins to approach him. His wife. <laughs> 
No, seriously. Instead of being greeted by a ginormous man-killing creature, Dom sees his wife exit the woods, before we realise that the creature has made him hallucinate, as he snaps out of it, to realise that he's face to face with this creature. It's the first time that any of us get to see it clearly, including Dom and then it rips him from the wooden post and impales him to a tree. The same woman enters Luke's room again and decides to conveniently fill us in on some well-needed backstory on this creature. Perhaps not the most convenient time, but we'll take it. Its name is Modur, and it's the daughter of the Norse god, Loki, an ancient god that forces these people to worship it in exchange for immortality. But seeing as it's the child of Loki, the trickster, chances are that there's going to be a catch to the whole immortality part. She explains that like everyone else here, he will kneel before the creature or face death. After she leaves, Luke manages to break free from his restraints, a little too late to save his buddy, but oh well, and heads to the room upstairs, where he can once again hear the demented sounds of people praying. But what he discovers upon entering the room is that it's filled to the brim with corpses. But then, the corpses begin to move, and Luke responds adequately by lighting them all on fire and engulfing the building in the process. The godlike creature may have granted them immortality, but nothing was said about stopping their bodies from shriveling up into ancient husks. After leaving the room, he's greeted by the old lady from earlier, and in a rather comical, yet somewhat realistic move, he just sucker punches her and moves on. The fire draws the ancient creature from the woods, and Luke finds a hunting rifle that he uses to swiftly deal with one of his captors before taking an axe from another. The creature pulls the eyes from one of its followers, and then reveals itself to Luke, before Luke then takes off running outdoors and manages to get himself a clear view of the creature. Now I'm no expert in Norse mythological creatures, but to me, that seems to be resembling something along the lines of a Wendigo. Luke aims the rifle, takes the shot, and then realises that he's made a great error in his judgement, as this does little more than mildly annoy the creature that responds by simply turning to look at him before deciding to take chase. The creature once again transports him into a dreamlike state before it knocks him to the ground and forces Luke to kneel before it. But Luke, in a moment of defiance, in stark contrast to how Robert was murdered, he stands face to face with the creature. Of course he's knocked to the ground again with ease, but this time he can see Robert and lying next to him, the axe. He picks up the axe and plunges it into the creature before turning around and sprinting his way out of the forest. But unlike Luke, the creature is bound to the forest and is unable to leave. Luke's abusing an outer bound glitch. So after a shouting match between Luke and a literal ancient god that impales people for fun, he simply walks away to find civilization, and then the movie ends. Just like that, it's over. It leaves you with more questions than answers. And that's good in my opinion. I almost feel like not directly informing the viewer that it's the ancient offspring of Loki would have been a better move for the movie to take. Like what they did with the runes, insert hints and visuals throughout the movie so that people already familiar with this mythology would be able to piece it together. Or perhaps it would even encourage people who aren't so familiar with it to go back through the movie and to try and understand it themselves. But that aside, it already does a great job of not letting you know things. The fear of the unknown is a great tool that can be used by filmmakers if wielded correctly. I kinda just like how this monster is there and stuff is just happening. Why would all this need to be explained? It doesn't. It also leaves the ending quite open-ended as well. It keeps you guessing as to what's going to happen to Luke as he returns to civilization. Is he going to try and explain to the authorities that an ancient Norse mythological creature just savagely murdered all of his friends? And are they going to be all like, yeah, sure buddy, and lock him away for the murders? Or are the authorities going to go searching in the woods and uncover the cult and their ancient god? And if so, is the whole world then going to know about it? Or maybe Luke is just deeply psychologically damaged after witnessing his friend being murdered, knowing that he could have stepped in to help, and has now just completely snapped and killed all of his friends in the woods. What if the forest ever gets cut down in the future? What happens to the creature then? We already know that it can't willingly leave. Would it just die? Or would it then be able to just freely roam, sticking anybody it likes to trees? Regardless, by not directly spoon-feeding us all of the information and backstory, this movie is going to live rent-free in my mind for a long time to come. And I guess as a filmmaker, that's the result that you want. You don't want to just create an entertaining film. You want people to remember your entertaining film.
Before we wrap things up, I'd like to give a big shout out to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Bort, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, Benz, Total Drama Rebooted, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Rin and Whiskey, Jarrett C. Bees, Nicholas, Pascal Mathis, John, Alex X. Jackson, Tajvia Sandhu, Chucky Dodd, Amy Denver, Victor Kartalov, and Richard McGowan III. Thank you so much for your continuous support to the channel, guys. As I've said countless times, YouTube isn't exactly fond of my content, so there's the very real chance that it gets copyright claimed, limited monetization, or just straight up no monetization. So your continued support to the channel means far more to me than I think you guys realize. So thank you so much. The channel's also got a Discord server, so if you'd like to discuss this movie, or other movies in general with like-minded people, there's a place where you can come together to do just that. Also, if you've got a recommendation for the series, that would be the best place for it. So once again, thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.